Today we are looking at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and our attention will be given only to the first 19 verses of that chapter, and we'll follow up next week if the Lord allows us. We'll follow up next week with verse 20 through 40, uh, but for this week, just 1 Corinthians chapter 14, uh, verses 1 through 19. Um, and again, we just want to start as we generally do by helping us to appreciate the context within which we find this 14th chapter in Paul's writing to the church at Corinth. And we've been situating uh, this letter uh, in the idea and around the notion of wisdom and unity and trying to get at the question of how does a community of faith, how do believers, uh, particularly in Corinth and those who were fairly new to the faith within the cultural context that they uh, were experiencing life in, how can they as pastors, um, can, uh, not, not pastors, I'm sorry, how can they as believers, how can they as believers live out the uh, demands of the faith that they profess within the context of the community where they are? Um, of course, we went several weeks, talked about the context of Corinth and the uh, building of the church and what have you. Here, Paul is sharing with them in a clear way in the 14th chapter how to meet the demands of Christian life and living, particularly as it pertains to uh, the gift of tongues. So that's what we're going to be looking at today, particularly the gift of tongues. And of course, before we do that, we want to make sure that you have an opportunity to share um, any thoughts or questions and any insights you may have. Um, let us know where you're starting from so we can make sure we're at least on the same page moving forward. So any questions from the weeks prior uh, to today and the chapters leading up to the 14th chapter or Anything in the 14th chapter that you read ahead and you just want to make sure that we touch on it, uh, feel free to unmute yourself or drop a comment and, and let us know um, how you feel. Um, this Deacon Dixon. Right. Hello. Um, chapter 14, verse, verse 2. Um, there we have the unknown tongue. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and is that the tongue that it sounds like from reading the scripture it's a, a language that you are talking to the Lord as opposed to any person because if it's uh, if it's known to a person already then it's not unknown so I guess that's where I started. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, that, so the question will come up pretty early, especially um, if one is to, if you remember what we kind of talked about last week when we talked yes. about the gift of tongues and how uh, we're put, when Paul is speaking of the gift of tongues in the worship experience um, and when we see the gift of tongues initially in the book of Acts in Jerusalem, uh, they are unknown tongues to those who don't know the language. But right? that means somebody does know it. That means somebody does know the language. That is correct. Which means for the people who know the language, for them, it's not an unknown tongue, but it still remains that if you don't know the language, it is an unknown tongue. Hence the word unknown. So there's not a whole lot of mystery behind that, that term, I think a lot of times when people talk about uh, the gift of tongues or speaking in tongues, uh, the mystery behind the unknown comes always for the, from those who don't know it, right? And so those who know the language or find themselves speaking the language in some ways, and this is what the issue is in the 14th chapter, I don't want to say too much right away, but in some ways, this is part of the issue that Paul is writing about, because those who know the language, or at least those who are speaking the language, um, and, and even those who don't know the language, have a way of lifting up that 
one particular gift as being something extra special beyond what the other gifts are. And that's not, it, that we shouldn't receive the gift of tongues in that way. Um, so let me just stop there because I'm going to say more about that verse especially. But I, I do appreciate you raising that as a, as a something that you noted, and we will we will definitely say more about it. Okay. All right. Thank you, Dickie Dixon. Any others? <clears throat> uh, yes, uh, I think I my question is kind of similar to Dick and Dixon's, but mine is more towards the end of today's scripture, verse eighteen. Uh, where Paul says, I thank my God, I speak with tongues more than you all. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we know as he traveled about, we don't have it recorded as far as I know in scriptures where uh, they were saying that he was addressing that particular congregation in tongues in any way. So mm -hmm. I think there is another factor possibly that, that he's saying that uh, he uses tongues in another situation, which may be in as a prayer language, uh, he, he speaks in tongues. Mm -hmm. So it, it kind of ties in with what Deacon Dixon was saying, but um, uh, I found it particularly interesting, uh, that statement that he, he speaks in tongues more than anyone else. Yeah. We don't see in the scriptures where uh, he was before uh, a congregation or uh, anywhere else where he was talking to them in tongues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. Um, and that's that's um, part of uh, I guess one of the I want to say the yeah the mysteries about tongues uh, when you take the 18th verse and you look at it against verse two, and then you look at those two against what chapter uh, 12 especially presents. Um, uh, and then you talk about, especially, well, chapter 12, yes, but then also chapter 13, when it opens talking about uh, noisy gong, clanging cymbals, and all of that. So the, uh, the notion again is, again is, that the tongue is a unknown or a mystery to those who don't know it. Um, it is not a mystery or an unknown to those who do know it and perhaps even to those who are speaking it. And it is a particular gift given to individuals for a particular purpose. The purpose for the tongue is to enable persons to receive, to hear, to know the gospel in a language that they can understand. I think you're right to also situate this with Paul and his travels. Now, um, something I said, I don't know if I said this last week or the week before, but to read the Bible is to understand that the, what is recorded in the Bible as historic fact does not necessarily include all of the details about a particular person or an occurrence. In other words, there's more to know. So in some ways we have to look at extra biblical resources or resources outside of the Bible in order to get the rest of the story or more of the story um, or some supplemental information to help us better understand the story. So we turn to people like Josephus, the early Jewish historian to help us to put the pieces together where they're not included in the Bible. So yeah, what I'm saying is that as Paul traveled, yes, he would have encountered people from different regions, different nations, who undoubtedly spoke different languages, right? So when Paul says in verse 18, um, he thanks God that he speaks tongue in tongues more than all of you, it may point to the idea that Paul, as you said, Deacon Murphy, has been to a number of places. And in order for the gospel to be heard in those places, it could be Paul was gifted by the Holy Spirit to speak in those languages. Okay, it could be that. Um, and then depending on how you construct that verse, 
It could be just that Paul is saying, I do it a lot, not necessarily I know a lot of different ones. So both of those are kind of at work in, in, that, in that verse. And so it's important to, uh, to know the angle or, or the perspective that one is speaking about or, or uh, interpreting Paul to be coming from. All right. So, and again, we'll, we'll um, I don't know if I, how much more I want to say about that, but I hope that uh, helps uh, to add on to what you're saying there, uh, Deacon Murphy. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Pastor. That that helps quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, I see your question here, uh, Deacon Dixon. So then, who is edified if no one clarifies what they are hearing? We're going to get to that. Um, there's a very specific answer to that question. And we'll get to that before we end our time today. Appreciate that question, though. Thank you for sharing it in the chat. Are there any other questions? Anyone else have anything that you've been looking at over the last week or so, or even just today, you picked it up in chapter 14. Any questions, any insights, any uh, comments you want to make before we move on? All right, if not, let's take a quick look back then what we're looking at in chapter 14, um, as I mentioned last week, is not in a vacuum. Chapter 14 occurs within the context of the letter, yes, but it also occurs within a closer context of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, all the way through the end of chapter 14. And these three chapters, chapter 12, 13, and 14, have a particular focus on spiritual gifts. The usefulness of the gifts as it pertains to the people of uh, uh, the believers in Corinth and how they as believers are to live together in light of the existence of this, of these spiritual gifts. All right. So you see what's, what's listed there. I want to share something that um, is noted and you see the uh, outline at the bottom in the Bible exposition commentary in that commentary. Um, about chapter 14, and this will be a way to get us into uh, the, our time of study for chapter 14. In that same commentary, here's what uh, Warren Wiersbe said as he introduces chapter 14. Paul has discussed the gift of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, and the graces of the Spirit. And now he concludes this section by explaining the government of the spirit in public worship. The government of the spirit in public worship. So there, there is the belief that in Corinth, there, there was a tendency for some of the believers there to exercise their spiritual gifts in a way that was um, out of order or lacking control. Um, and so part of the reason Paul writes these, these, these chapters, 12, 13, and 14, is to help them to understand some basic principles around how to govern themselves in worship, in the public worship context, in the light of the existing spiritual gifts. This is what chapter 14 is intended to convey. And if you see there at the bottom of uh, the screen on the outline for chapters 12 through 14, chapter 14 in its entirety deals with the governing of these gifts. And as I've uh, kind of titled it in my own little outline, it's about the wisdom. How can believers use wisely these gifts, demonstrating uh, or exercising these gifts in a manner that is wise, and we're going to hit on what Deacon Dixon uh, points out or noted rather in her chat comment. If you ask the question about how or how these gifts are to be used, or for what purpose, to what end are these gifts to be used, the very short answer is they are to be used to edify the body of Christ, to edify to edify, to edify. So if you ever you want to know um, what it is that ought to be happening, in short, it, uh, the answer is the gifts are intended to 
be edifying. All right. So in this particular chapter, chapter 14, this is part three of the four part uh, of the four part mini series, if, if you will, that is included uh, or that contains rather uh, 12, 13 and 14. So this is part three next week. With the conclusion of chapter 14, we'll look at part four of the mini series. All right, so in this chapter, Paul offers wisdom on how to view these gifts and then how to use these gifts. And I'm saying these because I want to make a larger point, but the text points specifically to one gift it's the gift of tongues. All right, so it's the gift of tongues. I don't want us to miss this because Paul is talking specifically about the gift of tongues, all right? I don't want anybody to accuse me of taking this and doing something else with what Paul is saying. He's talking about the gift of tongues, and we're going to be talking about the gift of tongues, but I think there's another point that can be made, and that is if we not limit the discussion to the gift of tongues and instead broaden our horizon and consider all of the gifts that the spirit gives to us. All right. So the, the focal point here is the gift of tongues. So as the conversation turns to the use of tongues, Paul reminds the believers in Corinth of the importance of unity as they worship God and fellowship with one another. His main concern is that the church be, quote, unquote, built up, built up as they edify one another. OK, he wants the church to be built up as they build each other up. Because, in fact, if the church is to be built up, it will happen because the people are built up. We'll see that connection, uh, I believe, on, on a couple slides down the road. So the main idea, the main point that I'm communicating here, kind of, um, if you don't catch anything else, the spiritual growth and maturity are demonstrated by the mutually edifying use of spiritual gifts. So that's me, again, broadening our view. But if you want to na narrow it down specifically to only what Paul is talking about, then that's that's absolutely correct, because that's what Paul is talking about. He's talking about tongues. So spiritual growth and maturity are demonstrated by the mutually edifying use of tongues. And you should note something here, that the gifts are intended to be mutually edifying. In other words, the one who has the gift should be able to build up someone else. The concern is not that the one who has the gift is able to be puffed up in and of themselves because they have this gift. The concern is with the gift that we build somebody else up or we build the rest of us up. However, uh, we find, <clears throat> excuse me, find opportunity for that. Okay, so chapter 14 verses one through 19, I see that happening over three um, types of, or three sections. The first is the building of the body versus building oneself. That's verse one through five. Then in verse six through 12, Paul makes a case against the primacy of tongues. And then in verses 13 through 19, uh, there are left here from the apostle Paul instructions for how to use the gift of tongues, all right? You need one kind of central uh, statement or focus to help with this, uh, this portion of chapter 14. I think it may look something like this, an edifying church. Spiritual gifts grow the church by helping to establish and build up the whole over the one. Okay. Any questions so far? Did I lose anybody along the way? Make sure before we dive too far in that we're okay. I have a question, Pastor. Please. 
I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, I'm thinking, okay, so what exactly does this look like in a congregation? Is it a congregation where there are people from different, shall I say, ethnic groups or nationalities? Mm -hmm. And somebody is speaking in tongues and there's somebody there to interpret what that person says. Mm -hmm. And so the one who was speaking in tongues, is that one delivering a message from God so that everybody is built up? Okay. Uh, I would say yes, given what you have. Uh, given your question, my response is yes. Um, of course, I'm also assuming that the message being communicated is similar to the message that everybody else is receiving. Right, right. Okay. There's somebody there right. who, the, they're not all, they don't say, for example, if there's just one person there who speaks a, a language different mm -hmm. from everybody else, mm -hmm. and somebody's, there's a message going forth, mm -hmm. and, and God, sees that that person would not receive that message that everybody else is receiving. Mm -hmm. If somebody does not speak in that person's language, mm -hmm. and then, so the, the person who speaks in that, speaks in tongues in that person's language, somebody would still have to interpret it because the other people would also have to know that they're all on the same page. Is that too simplified? No, I, I think that's that's right on the money. Okay, like yeah, I just want to see how how does it work? What, the, mm -hmm. what would it look like? Yeah, that, that I think that's right on the money. Um, if in the context of, let's say they're at the First Corinthian uh, Baptist Church, right? <laughs> the First Corinthian Baptist Church. All right. And uh, somebody from. Uh, where somebody from Philippi is visiting their cousin in Corinth and they go to the first Corinthian Baptist church. Now this person from Philippi, they may or may not know the language, you know, I don't know. They may or may not know it, but, uh, or they may not know it well enough and they're getting some things wrong. It may be the case that the cousin who they're visiting is able to maybe wait until after the service is over and then share with them what is being said what was being said or maybe that you know someone in the first baptist church of or of corinth or first corinth baptist church rather stands up and in the act of worship right then and there is able to interpret in the language that the person from philippi is able to understand um i think it happens in a couple of ways and i think in no matter which way um it occurs as long as it's not either disruptive to the worship service to the either disruptive to the worship service or distracting other people from the um, from the idea of worship then that's that's precisely what Paul would say should be done okay I got it thank right. you yeah and I'm taking that in case you need some additional support for that I'm taking that from how um, Paul references uh, the place or the role of women in worship, mm -hmm. where if in the worship environment, that woman uh, who Paul is rebuking, honestly, in that context, um, has a husband who can say to her, listen, this is what's going on. And they can kind of do that you know, themselves over the corner or they can wait till they get home, mm -hmm. but it's not for the woman to stand up in the middle of the worship service and say, hey, wait a minute, I'm lost. Uh, Y'all gotta help me and all of that, right? So that's, dis that's disruptive and distracting. Um, and the, I think the same thing would apply necessarily to the gifts yeah. if we're looking for consistency for, from Paul. And the Lord, it's uh, a deacon. Yes, elders. sir, go ahead. Okay, it, this reminds me of a person that is deaf and you're, he's in the service uh, or uh, and there's an interpreter there 
explaining to him what is being said at that particular time. Mm -hmm. This is what it reminds me of as far as the gift is concerned. Very well. Yep. It very well could be. I think that's a that's an uh, apt uh, comparison. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an apt comparison. The question that appears in the chat here is, so an interpreter is needed, so everyone will have an understanding. What if no one interprets in the congregation? All right. Uh, and that's part of the reason for the spiritual gift of tongues in the first place, because there were people in the midst in Jerusalem who would maybe, let me say this, they may not have understood what was being said, right? So they're from a different country. That doesn't mean that they don't know the Hebrew that was being spoken or yeah, the Hebrew that was being spoken in Jerusalem. It just means that either their dialect was a little bit different and they needed somebody to speak in that particular dialect or they were in Jerusalem and didn't know the Hebrew language at all, but they were there. And so they had somebody to speak in their language. Okay, the question is, what if there's nobody there to interpret? Well, if in the case where the person knows the Hebrew language, but they're from a different dialect, then that's probably gonna be okay. If the person is there in the uh, First Corinthian Baptist Church and there is no interpreter, then we have um, we have an. Uh, let me see. Are we going to get to that today? I believe we want to get to that today in terms of what to do if there is no interpreter. Okay, what to do if there is no interpreter? I think the tongue speaking person is supposed to be quiet. Well, <laughs> unless, of course, the tongue speaking person is the interpreter. I've heard that in the church before, where yeah. a person spoke in tongues. Yeah. And then told us what she just said. Yep. Yep. All right. So, um, of course, that question is bound to come up sooner or later. Uh, we're going to address that when we get more toward verse 13, I believe. All right. Okay, let's get to it. Let's get to it. Thank you for the questions. Keep them coming. Keep them coming. All right. So I want to make sure we're on the same page again as it pertains to some of the terms. Uh, from last week, you saw tongues and prophecy. They're the same. I just copied them and placed them into this week. Um, so that's, that's what we're talking about. When we talk in this chapter about tongues and about prophecy, we're talking about this. What you see on your screen, first tongues is language, speech trait, distinguishing one nation from another nation or a people group within a nation from a different group of people within the same nation. Just speech, tongue, language, okay? Prophecy, the gift of communicating and enforcing revealed truth, divinely empowered forthtelling or foretelling. Edify, that word is pronounced oikodomai, Okoidomai, it's a Greek term. Literally, it means to build a house, to build a physical structure. Literally, that's what it means. You see the reference from Acts chapter 7, verse 47 to 49. So how does the, does the apostle Paul use this term, which means literally building a house to apply to a group of believers. We, we, we see that, I think, going through this chapter, he uses the exact same words. The figurative sense is to build someone up, help them to stand, to be strong or sturdy, right? You don't wanna build your house on a foundation that is uh, unsure, right? And you don't wanna use faulty material in the building of your house. God forbid you hire the wrong contractor to work on your house, right? In the same way, you don't want to build someone up on a ground of lies and untruth. You don't want to help somebody to be strong in the faith, firm in the faith using uh, uh, um, 
uh, erroneous or uh, faulty material, right? The same way you build a house, the same ideas apply to building the person. And so Paul uses the same term to edify in this way. There's also a negative connotation uh, for this term. And I want to look that up really quick from 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 10. From the New Revised Standard Version, I'll read a couple of verses here, beginning at verse 9. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if you see, for if others see you who possess knowledge eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So the question that Paul raises is, if someone sees you doing something that is offensive to them or their understanding of the faith, and you continue to do that thing, and in this case, eating the meat sacrificed to idols, but you are stronger in the faith, or at least you have knowledge about Christ and what Christ uh, you know, demands or uh, expects from his followers. Somebody sees you doing the wrong, and you're the strong one, and they're looking at you as the example then what you're doing is building them up on something that at least in the stage that they are in is either faulty or incapable of withstanding the pressure of uh, or the demands of their faith. So Paul says in verse eight, and you remember we read, we studied, we talked about the eating of the food off to idols. Don't do those things. That's not edifying to the one who is weaker. It does not build them up in the right way. It builds them up. It sure does. But it's not going to build them up in a way that they will be strong and sturdy. You will not want your house built up the way that you are building someone else up by leading them down a path that is offensive to where they are in faith. So it's both positive connotation and should be seen as uh, believers working together in fellowship and community, lifting, building one another up, encouraging one another and all the rest. But it also can lean over into something that is negative. We want to make sure that we see this in the positive light and that as Paul is instructing the church, that we also are leaning in the direction of building and strength. All right, let's read. Let's read uh, verses one through five. Can we get somebody to read for us, please? You'll need to unmute your mic and then go for it. I can read, Pastor. All right, thank you. One through five. Yes, please. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. But he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God, for no one understands him. However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exaltation and comfort to men. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesy. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Now, of course, chapter 14 follows chapter 13. In chapter 13, the emphasis is on love. And the idea being that no matter what the gift is that you have, if you don't exercise that gift in love, it essentially amounts to nothing. Okay. So that's why Paul begins in chapter 14, verse 1 by saying, pursue love. Again, this is part of a mini series. It's an ongoing conversation or from Paul to them. And he's saying to them, based on what we just talked about or what I just wrote in regard to love, pursue that. 
out of all the gifts that you admire and look at and you see other people operating in their giftedness, and maybe you are also growing in your gifts and all of that, uh, the, what you really should be doing is chasing love. Follow after love. Do what love does. See where love takes you. Consider the idea that love may require you to move off of a position that you previously held in order to minister and serve in a way that exudes love. Pursue love and strive for the spiritual gifts. So look at the language that Paul uses, these verbs, these action words. He wants people to actually go after, to pursue. It's more than just having a desire for something. It's taking real steps in order to get to a particular goal, okay? The question might may be, so how, how do you pursue love? How do you chase that down? How do you strive after spiritual gifts? So a couple of suggestions here. One might be, as you have opportunities to engage with people, learn more about who they are, where they've come from, the various situations and experiences of life that inform where they are presently. Right, it's more than just I know your name. It may also be I know your story. That, that that will help you to pursue love, to know better how to love, come alongside someone in their time of need as you're serving, as you're ministering to them. Strive for spiritual gifts. Well, as opportunities are granted, that your current gifts are able to be used, take those opportunities. Watch how other people are serving and using the same type of gifts or gifts that you at the present moment believe are not your primary gifts, but you do admire how they work. So it's not wrong to admire what other people are doing and how they minister and observe what they do. But the error, we slip into error when we become envious, right? And we also slip into error when we uh, become a clone, don't wanna do that, right? But operating your gifts, but keep an eye out and watch how other people are serving. Strive for spiritual gifts. So this idea of love, um, are you, you maybe have heard it and you know it well firsthand, is an action word. Love does something, okay? In the same way with these gifts. So Paul says, pursue the gifts, pursue the gifts, pursue the gifts, and then does something interesting. He says, uh, especially, I want you to pursue one gift, pursue the gift that you may prophesy, that you may prophesy. Let's go back. What does it mean to prophesy? That you might communicate or enforce a revealed truth. That you might be able to foretell or forthtell with some divine empowerment. That's what it means to prophesy. So Paul says, Use love, go chase after love, seek to be built up in the gifts, but especially yeah, I would, it would be great if you would prophesy. What is the aim Paul is looking for here? Does Paul want people to be Isaiah and Jeremiah, right? Does Paul want people to be Daniel and the rest, Habakkuk, Zephaniah and all of them, Micah and Malachi? What is Paul talking about? Anybody want to venture a guess there? Any takers? Build up the body of Christ. By way of? Showing love. As it pertains specifically to prophecy. By foretelling and foretelling revealed truths. 
<laughs> He's going to take my definition. <laughs> and throw it back at me. <laughs> well, I would say yes, that's that's right. But I'm looking for something even more specific than that. Uh, does does love require I just put it in chat but does love require that you are always the one to forgive you are always the one to have to take uh, the blame for something do can can you stand your ground with love um, yes, and I, that's a separate conversation than the question that I'm asking here. So I'll take that in a minute and I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, but what is Paul talking about when Paul says, especially I want you to strive that you might prophesy? Now, remember, this is in the context of community believers, uh, perhaps those who uh, are new to the faith. Some have been in for several years, maybe three, three or so years since Paul uh, was there to first establish church. Now, if everyone, if Paul is saying, and this is for everybody, Paul is saying for everybody, I want you to strive to have this gift of prophecy or the gift to prophesy. What's Paul saying? He's not saying that he wants, you know, New Testament prophets like we knew them in the Old Testament to be. I, like, you know, doesn't want them. Paul wants each person to be able to do as Deacon Murphy tried to do with my definition, throw it back in my face. He wants everybody to be able to reveal the truth, to communicate the truth. And if the question is, what is the truth? Then the answer is, it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want everybody to know the gospel and I want everybody to be able to communicate the truth of the gospel in your context and community. Now, does that make you a prophet? If you are saying what God is saying, in some ways, yes, it does. Now, let's, let's not get into the area of the office and all of that and got the title. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about you exercising the gift of prophecy. You don't have to have, um, you know, a, a, a certificate of ordination to share the truth of the gospel. All right. That's what, that's what Paul is looking at here. The most loving thing that you can do, especially so if you want to pursue love and strive to grow in the gifts, the most loving and mature thing that you can do as it relates to ministry is to share the gospel and not just with unbelievers, to remind each other about it, to encourage each other with it, to be empowered yourself through it and because of it right that's that's what that's what the aim is in this uh section that's what paul is commending them toward okay so what what does what does this look like or how does this look like how do we build the body versus building oneself well part of the reason why and, and deacon dixon you asked uh first about verse two i told you we're gonna come back to that because that's uh pretty important to understand as it relates to this chapter. The reason why this chapter and chapters 12, 13, and 14 all together, but this chapter specifically, the reason why it's, it's necessary is because we had in Corinth uh, a certain, certain folks who had um, elevated the gift of tongues, to a place where it was not intended to be. In other words, and we'll talk about this later, I think it's the next slide. They lifted tongues as if it was the primary gift. Paul never says that I want you to pray and, and, and pursue love and strive for spiritual gifts, and especially that you might speak in tongues. And instead, his exhortation that you might prophesy. So by saying that you might prophesy right away, he's saying to the believers who are elevating the gift of tongues to this place where it should not have been. He's saying to them, you need to reevaluate what you are, what you have considered to be vital in your context. 
for you, the aim should be prophecy. For you, the aim should be communicating, sharing the good news. All right. So for those who speak in a tongue, do not speak to other people, but God. For those who speak in a tongue, do not speak to other people, but to God. What does this mean? If we are in a, what I would consider here a homogenous worship experience, in other words, everyone speaks the same language. If you have the gift of tongues, and you are in a worship experience where everybody else speaks the language that you speak. Your speaking in that gift of tongue or your use of the gift of tongue is an indication that you in that moment are speaking to God. Because everybody else no one understands it. That's what Paul says. Nobody understands that what you are saying because you are speaking mysteries in the spirit. It's, he's, he's, he still frames it as a spiritual gift. He's saying in that moment, now you're talking to God. You're not talking to the other people around you, which is the point of the gift of tongues in the first place. Okay. So, Let's jump back and grab prophesying from verse one and bring it into verse two. If you are prophesying, communicating the truth, sharing the good news about Jesus, building and edifying a people, prophesying in a community where everybody understands that language, to turn around and then introduce tongues in that same environment is not conducive to the act of worship. I hope that makes sense. Okay, so he says, go after the prophesying, because in verse three, those who prophesy speak to other people so that other people may be built up and encouraged and consoled. So if you're looking at the idea of why the tongues are being spoken in worship, when there is no one in the worship who understands the tongue then what we're looking at is one person with the gift building themselves up over against the notion of building the body up. And this is the reason for spiritual gifts, that the body of Christ may be built up. And this, friends, is how love looks. Love seeks to understand and it seeks to be understood. It's not loving for somebody who has the gift of tongues to stand up in worship when everybody speaks in our, and I'm talking our context, when everybody speaks English and you get up with the gift of tongues and speak something else. That's not loving. Is it, is it a spiritual gift? Perhaps it's just in that instance, that's not, that's not what love looks like. And if we're going to pursue the greater gift, the greater idea, Paul says, go after love. But now you want to stand up and say something that nobody understands? I fail to see how that's love. Okay, so he says, love is seeking to understand and be understood. This is why we Go to prophesying. Now, it also is intended, love is intended to edify, to encourage, and to console. I just read that in verse three. Love edifies, love encourages, love consoles. And in there, I hope you see the idea, again, around building up the body. Yes, I think you see that pretty easily with the word edify. We talked about that definitionally, but also encouraging. Perhaps you recognize it readily there, but then also in consoling, to console someone, to come alongside someone who is grieving and help them to process that grief is also a way to build them up. Okay, particularly if you're doing it um, 
with an idea of loving them in light of the gospel. Okay. All of this goes to strengthening others. Those who speak in a tongue, verse four, build themselves up. But those who prophesy build up the church. It can't get any more clearer than that, I don't believe. Okay. So it's, it's critical to understand what Paul is saying here. <laughs> Praise God for the gift of tongues. It's going to be needed. But in some situations, some environment, some worship experiences, some context is not. But you know what is? Prophecy. That we will be able to share and communicate no. some revealed truth. Yes. And the truth that is to be revealed and communicated is that of the gospel. May I make a comment, Pastor? Yes. I think this is marvelous. Because the way you've explained these two words, it's a way I've never heard it explained before. And I think for those of us who are older, I think what we remember about prophecy is somebody telling us what's going to happen 20 years from now, that mm -hmm. sort of thing, mm -hmm. that, that, that way of prophesying, okay, never looked at it another way and then like with tongues i remember as a, as a as a little kid being in church and we had this lady named miss halina miss halina always spoke in tongues and i used to love to see her come to our church she wasn't a member of our church but i thought it was fascinating i just thought it was the most fascinating thing i'd ever heard but nobody ever told us what she was saying so i think that's what you mean when you talk about how uh tongues was elevated yeah, you know, we thought it was something mysterious. Mm -hmm. And then like, I think it was last week when Deacon Inez and somebody else talked about it because they, they did, they've never spoken in tongues. They thought something was wrong with them. Mm -hmm. And then you were talking about, well, go ahead and learn another language. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, some of the, we could demystify some of what we, uh, have known previously right. or read in error yes. if we take a look at really what is being said as opposed to the surface word that we see and, and to be honest it is a mystery tongues are a mysterious thing yeah how did you get it if you didn't study the language right it's a mystery that's what's a mystery of the spirit so yes. it's, it's mysterious in that way but then it's also mysterious to people who are hearing it and don't know it right if I if I'm if I'm in uh, uh, I don't want to put myself in another country yet. Let's just say I go to I go to this Mediterranean restaurant. Uh -huh. I eat, eat at this Mediterranean restaurant, and they're speaking some Arabic dialect. Everybody in there is speaking some Arabic dialect. I don't know the language, but then the waiter comes over or the waitress comes over and starts speaking to me in English. Oh my God! Now listen. <laughs> in that moment i feel free and i feel like i'm at home and i feel even if it's just for the meal that i'm there to get i feel like i belong here like there's something for me here i might come back because that, that person knew my language i might now, if I'm in there I'm by myself and there's nobody to come over and you, they don't speak my language, I don't speak their language, I can't even read the menu, I'm in trouble. So it's the same, I mean, some of this stuff, if you think about it in the logical sense, it's the same way. You go to a church where you don't know the language and see what happens. Reminds me of an episode of Andy Griffith where they were in a French restaurant and they couldn't speak the language and Barney didn't want to say he didn't understand the language. So instead of asking, he just pointed to a couple of things on the menu and he ended mm -hmm. up with snails and water. I remember that episode. So here's the bottom line. Don't yes. be Barney Fife. <laughs> Don't be Barney Fife. Um, right. <laughs> yes. Um, if I may add, um, mm -hmm. I don't know when it was. It's very interesting um, 
um, how you are explaining the uh, scripture because I think it might have been maybe about a month or so ago I called you and told you about a minister that I had heard on TV with reference to speaking in tongue. Do mm -hmm. you recall that? And uh, the minister yes, yeah, I do. that when you're speaking in tongue, you're actually talking to the Lord. But mm -hmm. um, and the Lord understands, although some folks may not. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we had a brief conversation. You explained that process to me then. Mm -hmm. This is now this doesn't have anything to do with the speaking in tongue, because also doing Bible study some many years ago, Pastor Pat um, um, was talking about speaking in tongues and and different things going on. So it's not the first time that um, I've heard about it. But for my own self, when I hear people talking in tongue, they just bust out. I don't care um, what type of conversation you may be in, they'll bust out and start talking in tongues. And then they'll start back talking about whatever they was talking about. I always had thoughts about stuff like that. Then they'll come back to it and you can just be in a general conversation and you're around people and they just bust right out talking in tongues. Mm -hmm. And then they'll come back. It's just out of nowhere. Yeah. I always had thoughts about stuff like that. But you have put a good clear understanding on it today. Yeah, well, you know, it's not me. I'm just saying what the Bible says. <laughs> well, you interpreting that. That's your, your voice I'm hearing. <laughs> You know, well, I praise God for clarification. I do want to say something about yeah. that, though, uh, Beltina. Um, I think I do regularly remember the conversation now. So one more verse later, and I hear you, Deacon Inez. I'm coming to get you in a second. Verse five. I would like all of you to speak in tongues. You listen to what Paul says. He starts off by saying, pursue love, strive for the gifts, especially that you may prophesy. So he's already telling them, Listen, the, the big thing that I want all of you to do is be able to share and communicate the real truth of God as it pertains to this community of faith. It's the gospel message and how it might uh, portend or apply to various situations that you find yourself in. So I want everybody to be able to do that, to prophesy. I want you to do that. But then now he says in verse five, and well, he starts to make this case, uh, not as uh, almost as if he's saying prophesy over and above speak in tongues. And I was Say he definitely is. But then in verse five, he says, I want everybody to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. So I want you to let's, let's be clear. I want everybody to speak in tongues. But if I had to pick one over the other, I'd pick be everybody to be able to prophesy. Why? Because at the bottom, look at the value of these gifts. The tongues empower and enable ministers or members of the body to share the gospel prophesying encourages and strengthens members of the body to care for each other. This idea of tongues is intended for primarily those from outside of the body um, who may, who need to receive and hear the message of the gospel. The gift of prophesying is intended to help those who have already received the gospel to know now what to do with the gospel. Okay, now, um, one more thing, or two more things, Deacon Inez, before I come to you. One, to uh, Deacon Smalley's point about, uh, you said something about, um, oh, prophesying being foretelling uh, the into the future. So it is that, that's part of it, but it's also foretelling. It's foretelling and forthtelling. And the prophets of the Old Testament did both. Thus says the Lord is forth telling that God said this about what you are doing right now. And, and God said, change. God said, do this differently. God said, go send your sons and daughters off to marry. Forth telling, right? But then there's also foretelling. So that's the future thing that I think many of us know about. And that may, in fact, still be uh, resident in the body of Christ today. Okay. So that's that's one. And here's the other part. The notion of an individual in the context of worship speaking in tongue. Let's be clear. I, I am not suggesting 
that is the person who is sitting in the congregation off to themselves or maybe on a row with other people who is not talking to other people, but maybe almost under their breath in a whispered kind of way. And I think we've heard this, that person kind of slips off into speaking in tongues, okay? That's not what Paul is talking about here. Paul is not talking about that person on the end of the row or in the middle of the, of the church even, who is in the middle of the church, who does not have the microphone, who's not on the stage. No one's looking at the person. And the only reason you know they're speaking in tongues is because you're sitting close enough to hear them. That's not who Paul is talking about. Paul is talking about the person with the microphone, person on the stage, person who everybody's looking at and listening to, for that person to then slip off and speak in some unknown language is not helpful to people who don't know the language. Because that person exactly. at that moment, as they speak in the mic and garner everybody's attention, if they're speaking to God, they need to probably do something different, like take the mic away or turn around or something. I don't know. I don't know what the resolution is to that, but it's not the same. Like you get up there and you just go off with the tongues. Who understands that? If there's no interpreter, who, who is there to understand? And that's why Paul says, one who prophesies is greater than one who speaks in tongues unless someone interprets. So if you're going to do that, there needs to be somebody there to interpret. Yes. Uh, let me uh, go back. Uh, let me get Deacon Inez Williams first, and then Deacon Dixon. Yes. Deacon Inez? I have, can you hear me? Yes, it's got you. Well, he that speaks in a tongue speaks not to man, but to God for uh, sacred secret by the spirit. However, he that prophesies upbuilds and encourages man and comfort his soul. See, when I, now when I come up, we were told if you didn't speak in tongues, you weren't saved. And I never understood that. So now the way you explain it, we don't have to have to be saved. We are saved when we receive God personally, a personal relationship with him. And we, we accept yeah, we say we the son. Profess Jesus Christ as your savior and Lord. So therefore yeah, we don't have to worry about time. Right. And as they were saying that they were speaking personally to God because no one in the audience is listening anyway because they don't understand. I, I don't I didn't quite catch the end of what you said, Deacon Williams, but uh, uh, let me um, let me just when, let me when I was saying I, okay. I have a look in this Bible that I had I had read it. It was saying for he that speaks in a tongue speaks not to man. Mm -hmm. but to God mm -hmm. for no one listens but he speaks sacred secrets by the spirit I had never heard that either before mm -hmm. but I can I can understand the prophecy uh, better because as we learn the word and we share the love that God shares through his word and we give it out each day to people and loved ones that we see. To me, that is prophesying what the Lord has said and he has already done for some of us. And we can testify that his word is true because I think we I got have it. come yep. under a lot of pressure. Right. And the Lord right. had, you know, by asking the Lord for help through these trying times and we survived it. We can right. share that with others. And this is prophesying. I, I, I made me wrong. No, you're, I, think you're, I think you're on it and uh, for, provide it, however. This is, this is important to understand because they're in a community of faith. They are people of the way. They're followers of Christ. 
the notion of prophesying has everything to do with the gospel. Anybody can say anything about anything. But for the Christian, when Paul points to prophesying, again, it's the communication of revealed truth. And for the Christian, the revealed truth has been exposed and made available through Jesus Christ. And our prophesying must necessarily include the gospel. And I'm pushing that point because I don't want us to only be life coaches or only to be psychologists or only to be good people. I want us to be folks who lead people to Jesus, even other Christians. Maybe we need to be reminded about Jesus, be reminded about the precepts and the principles, the examples of his life that help us to do what you've just said, right? To overcome, to find joy, to always be encouraged. That's Jesus, right? And it's the duty of the Christian who prophesies. And that's what I want all y'all to do this. It's the duty of the Christian who prophesies. Point to Jesus. This is where people will find salvation. Uh, Deacon Dixon. Okay. Um... <sighs> As a member of like DCBC, right? Does everyone have to have the same um, response to certain things? Because I have a friend who's a member of a Baptist church in this area, in the PG area, not close to us, but, and what they did with respect to the tongues, I'm back to tongues, um, is they would give them a phrase. And then after church, they would go into this room with other people in their, in their same um, situation, that is not having spoken in tongues. The, uh, Deacon Dixon, it, just in the interest of time, we're only at verse five. I need to, I need to probably cut off the that rest of the question. Okay. And let okay. me just say this. Now, let well, I was just going to say, they were all put together to right. say a verse until right. it sounded uh, like tongues. Whatever is coming from some other congregation is the business of that congregation. As it pertains to D.C. Baptist Convention, for those who are listening and don't know what D.C. B.C. Uh, is, the reference is the District of Columbia Baptist Convention. It is the uh, most multi-ethnic, multi-racial association of Baptists in the country. Okay. Um, the, so we have to appreciate what that's going to mean for our associating in that way. There are some tenets of the faith that are absolutely necessary and vital. Speaking of tongues is not one of them. So okay. to answer your question directly, no, we don't practice all the same thing. And I'll just leave it at that. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, someone else is going to say something. I think it would have been Deacon Francis Garrison. Uh, yes. Okay. What's your I, question? I, I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering and going through my mind, and I'm saying, thinking, if I came to church and um, brought a friend with me <clears throat> who, who is a non-believer, mm -hmm. and they uh, experience several people in the church who are speaking in tongues, Mm -hmm. how would other than to say that they're speaking to God in their way is there another way to explain to them really what was happening uh, yeah um, one way is to do exactly what you said um, and, and let's uh, one of the things I try to do in these uh, study periods here is to try to unburden us from certain things. And one yeah. of them is I want us to be unburdened from the pressure of having to understand everything about everything. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. What you just shared, that person is speaking in a language to God, however you framed it that way, that's what needs to be said. Okay. 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 Now for the unbeliever, for the unbeliever, yeah, it's gonna sound, um, and I use this word carefully, it's going to sound like foolishness, right? But that's not your concern necessarily, right? 
that person, again, if they're doing it in a way that Paul, I think, would would uh, prescribe by, again, I, using my example, just somebody who's in the congregation, just sitting there, they're minding their business, they're not talking to you or anybody else, they're worshiping mm-hmm. in their own space, and then they start speaking in tongues, that's not our business anyway. Okay, okay. We're just overhearing conversation. We don't have to, like, um, all of that's not our business. Do you talk about it? If it's the leader, mm-hmm. now that's something else. Then that's the whole different ball of wax. And then, then I would, you know, I would right, say, right. yeah. Okay. Thank okay. you so much. <laughs> no problem at all. No problem at all. All right. Uh, I appreciate the comments and questions. Um, if you have more, of course, please drop them in the chat. Uh, we need to we need to make we need to cover a little bit more ground here today. <laughs> we need to cover a bit more ground. Six through twelve. Now Paul makes a case against the primacy of tongues. Remember, I started out by saying this portion of the text is uh, offered in part because there are some folks who have elevated the gift of spiritual tongues to a place of reverence or what have you uh, that it should not occupy um, in the church. Paul says in verse six through twelve. Um, that gifts are not, or rather the tongues are not the primary thing. And just flat out, if brothers and sisters, if I speak to you in tongues, how will I benefit you unless I speak to you in some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching? So you see how right away in verse six, Paul talks about other spiritual gifts in order to counter the ineffectiveness of tongues. Okay. He talks about knowledge, the gift of knowledge, the gift of prophesying, the gift of teaching. These are gifts that are intended to edify. And these, what Paul is going to say about spiritual gifts is that they don't occupy the primary place. What tongues will do, used incorrectly, is cause confusion. And over against that confusion, there are gifts in order to provide clarity. And those were, that's what we just read. Gift of knowledge, gift of prophecy, gift of teaching. These are intended to provide clarity, not confusion, right? It is the same way with the lifeless instrument that produces sound like the flute or the harp. If they don't produce their distinct sound or give out the notes that you know them for, how will anyone know what is being played? Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard, you know, the young child or even the older person who's just picking up an instrument for the first time, this wonderful sound and flute makes just heavenly sounds when it's used correctly. But if you don't know how to play the notes, you don't know what the right finger positions are, you, you don't know the breathing techniques and none of that, you can't read music. Uh, <laughs> praise God for growth, but in that moment, that's, no, that's not what we wanna hear, right? That's what it is with tongues misused or in a, uh, applied in the wrong way, okay? So tongues, Use the wrong way in the wrong case, the wrong method causes confusion. And that's not the intention. To edify, there needs to be clarity. Okay, so these second argument against the primacy of tongues um, among spiritual gifts is that tongues promote uncertainty where there should be understanding. Verse eight, if the bugle, again, he's here with this, uh, the instrument um, metaphor, If the bugle gives an indistinct sound, who will get ready for battle? Now, they know what Paul is talking about because if you, and maybe you remember the old Western movies or what have you, when the bugle sounds, when the horn sounds, that it it sounds a distinct sound for different things. They know the sound the bugle plays when it's time to go to war. They know the sound the bugle plays when it's time to retreat. They know the sound when it's time to gather for a meal in the mess hall or the mess, whatever, right? They know the sounds. But if that bugle sounds or lets out a sound that no one understands, what what then to do with the army? How do they function? It's the same way in the community of faith with the church. 
this uncertain time is not conducive to edifying the body. Verses 9 through 11. The argument against tongues is that it also creates foreigners where there should be family. It creates strangers where there should be commonality. Verses 9 through 11 help us to see that. Paul says, now let's take this example of the, the instruments that I've been talking about. Now let's apply it to you. So with yourselves, if in a tongue you utter speech that is not intelligible, how will anyone know what is being said? You'll be speaking into the air, he says. Um, jump down to verse 11. If then... I do not know the meaning of a sound. I will be a foreigner to the speaker and the speaker a foreigner to me. And friends, what a terrible place for the church to be in where they are gathered together in a place where there should be unity in the fellowship, all united for the purpose of worshiping God. Mm -hmm. And then there is a foreign, uh, a relationship that is, that is created by, uh, or rather a, a stranger relationship, a stranger dynamic created by the use of this one gift. Where there should be unity, there is disunity. Where there should be understanding, there is misunderstanding. Where there should be clarity, there's lack of clarity. Because this person is speaking in a sound or is making a sound that I do not know. Paul says, that person becomes a foreigner to me and I to them become a foreigner. I hope you see what, what's happening here. So the, the idea is this. And Paul does not intend to speak against the gift of tongues. That's not what Paul is doing. He's not speaking against the gift of tongues. However, he does insist that tongues not be elevated and certainly not elevated at the expense of other gifts that are intended to build up the belief. I hope you see that that's happening um, in this section of the text. Real quick, any questions before we move on to the last part? All right, 13 through 19. We have now here instructions for how to use these gifts. When we start off by saying this section is going to be the governing of the gifts of tongues. And now we're going to get more specific with that. Since the tongues do exist, and since there is a benefit for them. In fact, Paul says, listen, I want you to get it, especially if there's somebody to interpret. I want you to have it. Right. So we know there's a benefit to this and it, it can be good. So since they exist, how are they to be used in a community context? That's the question that is underlying verses 13 through 19. And here we get three instructions that Paul gives to the church at Corinth. First instruction is to pray for the gift to interpret. Second instruction is do not forsake the natural offering of prayer and praise. And then the third instruction is to let your aim be the building up of people. Let's take a look at this and then we'll be done for today. Verse 13, 14, therefore no one who speaks, therefore rather one who speaks in a tongue should pray for the power to interpret. If I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unproductive. Interpretation invokes the mind. There is um, here some uh, the way that some people, I think, erroneously try to separate the spirit from the mind as it pertains to worship. Paul is not separating the spirit from the mind. Instead, what Paul does is to say, if you only operate in the spiritual gift and relegate the natural gift or the natural tongue that you have, English for us, 
if you rele if you relegate English to some secondary thing in worship, but elevate the spiritual tongue in worship, then you have, in essence, left your natural sense, the mind, off to the side as if to say, I don't need to think. I don't need my natural senses. Paul says, I want you to have it. In fact, if you have it, pray for interpretation because interpretation then invokes that which is natural. Okay, so Paul does not separate spirit from natural or spirit from mind. Instead, Paul says, if you got this spiritual gift, make sure you don't lose your mind. Okay, pray for the gift to interpret. If you've got the gift of tongues, pray for the gift of interpretation. And I said earlier that in that moment, the one who was up front with the microphone and they're uh, speaking in tongues and they're exhorting and what have you in tongues and they're doing it publicly in a public way. My hope is that they prayed for the gift of, of interpretation and that they will use the gift of interpretation in that moment. So uh, one more time, I am not saying that the person who is center stage with the mic has everybody's attention can never speak in tongues. I am saying that the one who does it, I, my prayer is that they also have the gift of interpretation so that they can follow up the, the, whatever they're doing in tongues, in spirit, with the mind, with the natural. I think that's what Paul is getting at here. Because in a public worship setting, it's not just about you. It's not just about the one. And it's certainly not about impressing or trying to impress other people with your gift. No, pray for the gift of interpretation. Second, don't forsake the natural offering of prayer and praise. Just because you speak in tongue or know how to do it, or you've got the gift, does not mean that you can't pray to God in a language that is understandable to other people. Yes, the conversation is still between you and God. No, it's not really anybody else's business what you and God are talking about. But other people can really be helped if you are having a conversation in English. And I'm just using our context. Whatever the natural language is, right? The human audience may be able to understand. And isn't that the aim if we're all together in one place for one purpose to understand so that we can all be edified? Speaking in a sense that is not natural, that is not understandable, is contrary to that aim, especially if we don't know it. So Paul, verses 15 through 17. I think says here, don't forsake the natural. What should I do then, he says. He says, I will pray with the spirit, but I will pray with the mind also. Going back to the mind thing, natural. He says, I will sing praise with the spirit, but I will uh, sing praise with the mind also. So you see how he always attaches the mind to the spirit. If you don't, Paul says, if you say a blessing with the spirit, how can anybody in position of an outsider say the amen to your thanksgiving since the outsider does not know what you are saying? And do you know who the outsider is? It's not the one from my earlier example. It's not the one from Philippi. It's not the one from you know Alabama, right? It's everybody else who's in that place that's not you. Everybody is the outsider who doesn't understand what, you're, what you are saying. And Paul says, if you are blessing God, if you are praising God, if you are honoring and uplifting God, exalt, exalting God and all of these wonderful things, and nobody understands what you're saying, nobody else can join in with your thanksgiving. We can't say amen to that because we just don't know what you're talking about. Now, some people get excited about it. And there may be some people who have the gift of interpretation that will be able to help. But unless we know what you're talking about, uh, you know, again, I, if we're in fellowship together and we're supposed to be united together for common purpose, other people should be able to amen what's being said. 
You should be able to come along with you. So don't forsake the natural. Use the spirit. That's what Paul says. I will, I'll pray in spirit. I'll praise in spirit. But while I'm doing that, I won't forget the mind. Okay. Lastly, verse 18 and 19, instructions for using the gift of tongues. Let your aim be the building up of people. We've been saying this before. We'll say it again. The aim ought to be to edify. The aim ought to be to edify. I thank God, he says, that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Paul might be bragging. I don't think he is. He just might be saying, I've got the gift and I've been using it more, as I said earlier with Deacon Murphy's questions, or had opportunities to use more of them. Or, or more tongues, all right? In either case, praise God for it. Like, that's how you know, again, Paul's not saying that he's not anti-tongues because he's been using it. He's got them. He's not anti-tongues, but he wants them in the right place. Nevertheless, in church, I would rather speak five words with my mind. I'd rather speak five words in, that, in a natural sense in order to instruct other people than 10,000 words at a time. So personal satisfaction can be found in interpersonal connection and effect if we build people up. And that's the point. That's the point. That's verses 1 through 19 of this 14th chapter. Next week, we'll pick up with verse 20 through 40, and we'll see where uh, Paul is going to take us next with the conversation. Um, but any questions, anything we need to uh, kind of hope maybe clear up or help you out with before we go 